Zombie Tech. <sighs> Welcome to Zombie Tech, a forum for engineers, scientists, and inventors to ponder on the technologies needed to survive the inevitable zombie apocalypse. She's Eddie. He's Whisker. And who do we have this week? This week, we have Maker Dino back again. Woo! Hello, hello. Hello. So we uh, were able to get uh, or to chat with Dean here uh, around mid, about the middle of his hack a week marathon. So he um, had committed to a year of hacks, one a week, and uh, we got him around near near around twenty six. And we dis- we told him that uh, when this was all done, that we would bring him on again and see. Uh, if there are any updates and if um, his brain had turned into a zombie, right. from all the hard work, correct, kind of kind of jelloey, but not <laughs> not zombie, not quite zombie. Okay, <laughs> a little scrambled on a few of the uh, projects, <laughs> to which you were witness a few times there. <laughs> yep, and that's always how it goes with projects too. I mean, there's always totally set, setbacks, but um, that's how it works. Yeah. So welcome back. Thanks. Good to be here. Thanks. Um, and uh, let's see. You said you had a story before we started started recording. Oh, yes. What's up? Well, I had the uh, l- the last time around. It was uh, a little SM57 microphone and a little piece of junk preamp thing, and it didn't work that well. You guys remember the levels were kind of up and down and in and out. And I kind of got tired of that setup. And there's a local pawn shop here. I've been eyeballing uh, an art. Tube MP. I think you guys have one of those, don't you? Where yeah, you have I do. Store yep. anyway. Yeah, I sure do. Yeah, so I I saw one of those sitting in there, twenty nine bucks. I went, wow, that's cheap. And there was uh, a couple of mics came and went, and there was a MXL nine ninety in there, just a little capsule mic, made sure. in China yeah. capsule mic. But they're good. They, you know, they're cheap, but they're okay. They work great. Uh, that was like sixty nine bucks, and then a mic stand. So I, you know, I hauled all of it to the counter. Told the guy, I'll give you like ninety bucks, and he goes, well, a hundred bucks out the door. <laughs> I'm like, <laughs> awesome, that's cool. I'm happy. <laughs> so I get home, plug it all in, you know, excited, like, great, this is gonna work out perfect for podcast. Finally, got you know, condenser mic back. Plug it in, and the input's all scratchy and weird as I wiggle the jack around, and I see this big dent in the back where someone dropped it once, probably oh. plugged in. Oh. And so I went, ah, okay. Thankfully, the 990 is a very simple design on the inside. So it's really should, simple. Yeah, yeah. Pretty easy to fix that. Yep. Popped it all. Uh, well, it wasn't the mic. It was the art. I mean, the, the oh. art preamp. Uh. The tube preamp. Yeah, that had been dropped. So I open it up and go, yeah, okay. Cold solder joint. No big deal. That's just, you know, old hat to people that solder, right? Mm-hmm. Three little things. Solder that up. And um, notice the tube was in there a little crooked. So I kind of pushed that back in straight mistake <laughs> because Did you break a pin the, when they build these things they actually put that in a little crooked because it just ever so slightly clears two big old capacitors ah. on, on the board and i'm oh. putting it together and there's a little resistance i'm like what's going on and i hear pop oh no <laughs> i popped the top right off from the tube the 12ax7 and i was like oh, no. oh my god shi <laughs> tango <laughs> And so I was like, crap, you know, I look at the clock, I go, I got an hour, I've got to make this happen. So it's like, here I am back at, you know, a friggin' deadline. <laughs> back at hack a week. <laughs> Fortunately, I had a couple tube tube uh, devices around. I opened a radio first, nothing in there. Yeah, and, and a oh, one, one two ax 7s a really common tube, so yeah. Exactly, you know, but there wasn't one in this radio. There was one in there like that, but it was designed by Sylvania Low Hum. Didn't work, I tried it. And then I went, wait, I just hacked an amp here a few hacks ago. So I went and opened that one up, found a nice vintage 12AX7, and right now my voice is running through like a 60-year-old tube. <laughs> oh. Awesome. <laughs> That's pretty cool. Oh, wow. That's, yeah. Then I end up having to make a cord for the thing too to go into my mic in and all this other junk and finally got it all back together. And uh it's it's working great. It's a pretty good setup, you know. Nice. A little nice. uh quickie, hang some blankets in the room to deaden it up a bit, and here we are, ready to go. I've got a uh I also have a rack mounted two channel version of that simple art tube preamp. I've been thinking mm-hmm. about buying a couple of uh, uh nice tubes for it. That's what's fun about tube stuff, isn't it? You can just start, you know, playing around with different ones because they all work a little bit differently in different circuits. And sometimes you just get a nice, sweet sound out of one that another one might not produce. Yeah. 
Well, that's that's cool. Nice. I mean, I'm glad you were able to find a tube that was appropriate too. Yeah, me too. <laughs> <laughs> it was like because... slight slight panic moment. I'm like, great. I'm gonna go off the back to the previous <laughs> setup, which sounded like Bleh. it just wasn't. <laughs> well, that's we okay. probably have about eight or nine of those in the house, Eddie. Those uh one two eight sevens. Yeah, I guess we do. Yeah. Yeah, if I, I I used to have some stuff like that around, but you know, not so much the tube anymore. It'll probably slowly build back up as time goes by. Now, did you have to use a tube tester or anything to make sure it was okay, or did you just stick it in? Nah, you know, just to plug it in and see if it works. But it came out of a working amp. That one that I oh, turned. I see. Remember the record player hack I did? I turned it into a practice amp for my guitar. Yep. Yep. It was about like six weeks ago, something yep. like that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that uh, and many, many, many other projects are up at hackaweek.com, right? Correct. That's right. 52 of them. Correct. And a bloopers this last week. So. Which was hilarious. Yeah. <laughs> we watched <laughs> that when you put it up. That was really fun. Fun making it, too. A lot of time. It, like I'm sure you appreciate just how much time it takes. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, we do that sort of thing every week, too. So it's, mm-hmm. uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, there's definitely uh, some recognizable moments there of <laughs> you start and then you're like, ah, oh, crap. <laughs> I did that wrong. What was I going to say? Start over. My favorite was the one where I like, I went, I made it through Hack 13 and then I went, Hack 13 was crazy. <laughs> <laughs> and I get this blank look on my face. <laughs> it's like, that, one just, that was the best to me. That one was awesome. It just told it all. Like I was right kind of in that. You know, three months into it going, what have I done? <laughs> I have to do a hack every week. I'm going crazy. But it's, it, was, it was a lot of fun. And uh, I look forward to doing more stuff in the new year. It won't be quite the same as like a project every week. It's kind of what a lot of people, including you, have suggested to just update ongoing projects would still just be, you know, just as fun to watch and follow along with it like people like to do. So Yeah, people like a narrative. So mm-hmm. adding that little th- uh, string from video to video is uh, a nice narrative element for it, and it's a little bit less work easier for you to, to <laughs> yeah, because it's not, have to come up yeah. with an idea every week, right. right? And then with that comes all the challenges of you know trying to pull it off, and there's always way more things that come up that you need to deal with than what you think of. Always, that's just how it works, right? So and that's the fun. So uh, for those who don't either haven't heard the previous episode with you in it or uh, aren't aware of Hack a Week yet, um, can you tell them, tell us a little bit of what, how you decided to do it? And uh, sure. yeah. Yeah, Start that was that. Uh, kind of inspired by a post on uh, Hackaday. Great site. A lot of people go to Hackaday and check out stuff. And that's uh it was like uh, something they had posted that went more or less like we want someone to work for us to do a video or project every week, document it, make a video, and we'll pay you thirty thousand bucks a year. And you know you got to live in Santa Monica. And, and everybody on the on the comments just kind of came in and went, "What are you crazy? Thirty thousand bucks in Santa Monica? <laughs> I'll get you a cardboard box. <laughs> yeah, you live in a cardboard box." And everybody <laughs> laughed about it, and I thought that was pretty funny. And I had been doing videos on uh, DinoFab my other site and I was kind of getting into doing it. I'm like, this is, you know, it's kind of fun. I like this. It's, you know, inspires people and it's fun for me. And then that happened. And I'm just the kind of person that'll, you know, Sagittarius on a whim will go, <laughs> okay, you know, hell with it. Let's do it. I'm going to do it. I'm going to do, I'm going to do a hack a week. <laughs> right. So right. just to kind of do a thing in their face, like, you know, nobody's going to answer your ad, but maybe, you know, who knows? But anyway, I figured I would start my own site. And so I did on April 1st last year. April Fool's was the Ooh. first act. And then this year, April Fool's, of course, was the bloopers. That So it kind of worked out pretty good on that Perfectly, way. Perfectly, yeah. But that was how it started out. And initially it was like, I could, yeah, this is this will be easy, you know. And, and then the part that really surprised me was just how much time every one of these took you know mm-hmm. the simple ones where you just do a simple little circuit you just churn and burn it out and here it is here's the schematic explain it those aren't too bad when you're doing experimental things like the wally that was nuts or you guys remember what i went through on that mm-hmm. stupid little robot mm-hmm. just to make it work and it was just some simple hurdles but that's that was the big surprise to me is just how much time it takes to to pull it all off right right 
And, and so it was a project a week. That was kind of my goal. Just come up with something new every week. doesn't have to be electronics. It could be anything I dreamed up. And I kind of ran through quite a few different things along the way. So I feel I totally met the goal I wanted to. Mm-hmm. Everything from how to kill strawberry plants to uh, <laughs> exactly. uh, fix a lawnmower. Uh, yeah, there's all sorts of stuff on there. That's awesome. I love the way you said how to kill strawberry. Because I had a moment of silence, what, two acts later? Or act. <laughs> moment of silence for the strawberries. <laughs> well, not not all right of the here. hacks went well. Let's I just learned, put it though, that way. <laughs> it was too much fertilizer. And the trick is the water shouldn't be soaking the roots as much as I had them doing uh, that. I talked to some people who have done some hydroponic stuff with vegetables and tomatoes in particular. So I'll you know, try it again maybe this summer. It's a topic that comes up a lot on this show because uh, if you can't go outside to play on a farm, oh totally. When I was working on that, bitten. I was thinking about the zombie apocalypse. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it would be really nice to be able to have strawberries in the basement. Yeah, yeah the zombie apocalypse is never far from my consciousness. <laughs> working on things I always think this would be perfect yeah let's log that away well that's why you're on our zombie apocalypse team you bet yeah so uh what are some of your more mm, favorite episodes that you've done or projects that you've worked on oh <laughs> you guys know which one i'm gonna say first <laughs> the uh the the crazy doll thing i did <laughs> <laughs> i totally just you know it was one Best of those e- epic fails on, on the, the <laughs> hack I was doing. didn't work out. And there it was the day it was due. And I was expecting it to work totally. And it just failed. Didn't yeah. do anything. Yeah. And I didn't really want to post it. A few failures is okay. But when the end result fails, I was like, nah, I got to do something. So I just actually glued a weird doll head onto a little hexabot and drove it around and acted like a madman. <laughs> <during> <laughs> the process. Is it still and there? You- that's uh, that, yeah. All the uh, oh, the um, the the the, blah, blah, the actual little uh, hack thing. No, I took it apart. Oh. Some of my stuff kind of got repurposed as time went by. I was like, wait, I need that Arduino, so I pull it out of the previous <laughs> thing and you know, sure. dump the new code onto it. And other things like just hardware, I would you know pull them out of some other ones. So not all fifty-two things are on a shelf somewhere, you know, right. <laughs> with lighting on them or anything. Well, it's so then just... my question is, what would you use the doll's head for? <laughs> that. Okay, so you Wait. guys watched oh. me saw the doll's head off. Then That's it went right. on to the Hexa baby, and then it went on to Sophie's Halloween costume as the headless right. horseman. Right. <laughs> and that's, that's where right. it still sits on top of the bench. So that was a favorite. The LM386 amp was a lot of fun because yep. that was one I built when I was like 21 or two to stick with my Walkman and just blow my ears apart. <laughs> and a lot of people like that. I still get emails all the time about that. Nice. So that one was a lot of fun. The uh, the whack a mouse was just a riot. That one is probably, I would say, my favorite of all because mm-hmm. of just how cool it is. It's really really simple. The thing is nothing to it, and it's just this neat little toy. Kids love to play with it with the with the cat. I mean, I've had it <laughs> places where kids could mess with it, and kids love it. They think it's just a riot and watching the cat or themselves messing with it. You know? <laughs> They're like, whoa, wait, wait, the mouse disappeared. Oh, oh, wait, wait. <laughs> or like, my cat okay. J Fat. Okay, you know, Tommy. <laughs> JPET's like a little hacker cat. He he figured out a new way to play it that I didn't even think of. He reaches in the hole <laughs> that the mouse went into and he pulls on it. And when he does that, he's actually triggering the limit switch in the back. And because the polarity's <laughs> been changed now by the other little switch, it, it comes back the other way. So <laughs> instead of going to the other mouse and smacking it, he reaches in the hole and pulls it out, and then it comes back out. He smacks it, and it goes back in, and he pulls it back out. <laughs> so for those of you who haven't seen it, it's basically uh, a little uh, little house, a little mouse house that has two mouse holes in it. And uh, a mouse sticks its nose out of one of the holes, and when a cat bats at it, it uh, flips the circuit around, and it pulls that mouse in, and a m- another mouse comes out of the other one. <laughs> as far as the cat's concerned, it's the same mouse running back and forth, uh, <laughs> teasing the cat. Well, let's see what else. Uh, the FM bug was kind of neat in that I did the opening actually with a microphone coming through that tube amplifier, which that just that sound was mm-hmm. so awesome. Like, you know, AM radio or well, it was FM, but it sounded very AM. So that one was a lot of fun. Um, 
I was waiting in your blooper reel for like a neighbor to knock on your door and tell you to stop <laughs> transmitting <laughs> because you were you were interfering or something. I was like, oh man, that would have been epic. <laughs> that would have been so cool. That would have been a lot of fun. <laughs> oh, sorry, man. Didn't mean to. <laughs> <laughs> well, then the, there was another one too later, the chase a mouse I did not too long ago. That was mm-hmm. kind of fun. Mm-hmm. JFET got involved with that one too. That one was fun. Um, the New Year's ball drop thing I did, that was very whimsical and extremely spur of the moment. I just thought of it really quickly, implemented the thing, built it all in 24 hours time probably. Just that one was great. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> and then of course the ones I did with Lisa were a lot of fun. The the soda pop and the pan galactic gargle blaster. <laughs> Those were terribly awesome. Like, that was just a nice breakout. Cute. You know, it was like, okay, I'm going to do theater on the sack. <laughs> uh, so that was great. Yeah. Yeah. Nice. Nice. And all the transistor stuff was a lot of fun too, because I actually learned a thing or two about, you know, working with them. I hadn't worked with transistors very much at all, just a little bit here and there. And when you get into just putting them on a, on a board and playing around, you realize just how tricky it can be sometimes mm-hmm. to get the bias just right on them and to learn about what that's all about and, how it works with the transistor. So I learned a lot of things along the way too and inspired other people to do the same. So that's always a, a pretty exciting thing for me. If I get an email that someone is working on a project that I've posted as their college project, that just makes my year. That's awesome, you know? Yeah. Yeah, that so. uh, front bias little uh, 2 and 3906 uh, preamplifier that mm-hmm. you did... Uh, got me off a whole line of things and resulted in a really nice preamp design. Yeah, you you took that one and initially cascaded it, right? And put two of them together. Yeah, uh, I had to change it a bit because it was designed for an electric mic originally. Right. And I had to change it so that it would work well with dynamic mics. But mm-hmm. yeah, and then put one after another to get the, the gain up to a professional uh, line level uh, voltage and uh, current. So... Yeah, but once I got it, it was like, wow, this is this is this sounds, sounds really, really good. good. Yeah, it was pretty cool. Yeah, we actually were able to. I think from some from inspiration from some of your designs, we were able to come up with some that sounded even better. I think than our professionally bought amplifiers. Yeah, that mm-hmm. project amps, actually so. made it into uh, Audio Express magazine. Yep. Did That's an article cool. about us, yep. uh, and that was one of the things that they wanted to talk about was the. The little cascade preamp design. Yep. yep. Pretty neat. The simplicity of it's just beautiful too, you know? Yep. Yeah, exactly. and if you uh, ever read that magazine, uh, look out for that article because you're in it. Yes, huh. you are. Check it out. Make your Dino. We'll see if we can find a link for you. Cool. Um, But so you've mentioned, and I think it's really cool that you're inspired to inspire other people. Totally. Um, and you've actually had quite a few opportunities because of Hack a Week. Um, in terms of, you actually get, you've been featured on Hack a Day probably more than anybody I know. A whole bunch. It's <laughs> like, I, I actually looked one day because I bookmark every one of them when they do that. And, mm-hmm. you know, of course, I just, you know, shoot them the content every week. It's up to them if they want to post it or not. But quite a few of them are up there. I The last count, it was more than half, I think. Something yep. like that. Yep. And some of the, the comments from that side of the fence is always pretty funny. <laughs> Well, it's just, I mean, as much as you tell trollers to. Oh, it's just a different, it's a different, <laughs> a different crowd than the YouTube comments by far. And, uh, I'm, it, and it's a funny thing because you can't really look at either one as being, oh, this one's good or this one's bad. And, you know, mm-hmm. it's, it's just kind of a 50 50 mix on all of them. But, mm-hmm. but there's some funny ones on, uh, on Hackaday. But then usually there's somebody that just comes along and goes, hey, shut up. <laughs> you didn't guy. do it. You didn't do it. He did. So. Yeah, I kind of I kind of like that. Yeah. 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 And then you've all, aren't you, um, now I don't know if I'm supposed to say this or not, but aren't you going to be able to be featured in, I think, Make? Oh, yeah, Make. Yeah, it's, it's totally cool to mention all that. It's cool. uh, coming up in the summer issue. I've got a uh, automatic ball launcher I did. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. The, the original was like a slingshot a long time ago. I made that one, and it was kind of a spinoff from the one with that little sausage dog that's on YouTube. Lots of people have seen that. That thing has got a couple million views, I think, by now. Mm-hmm. And it was an engineer guy that built it, and it's obvious because it goes through so many steps. And it's got all these safety features and everything else, and it's really cool. But I wanted to 
uh, like I always do, kind of gravitate towards simple, simple, and right. eventually came up with that design, refined it through about three different iterations to what it was when Make saw it. Then they asked me last year to do a little feature on it for uh, uh, Make Live, just a little five-minute video about it, and I did, <clears throat> and people loved it. They got that feedback, and then they approached me a few months back and asked me if I wanted to write an article and um you know i'll write up a how-to with you know the photos and all that and then what they do with an article like that is uh after it's submitted and basically you know you submit the article and you're paid and that's that and then they build it they take your instructions oh. and one of their interns builds it and nice. there's a guy right now that's been in contact me email you know a few questions here and there and just kind of work out the whole process of the build and then they go ahead and take that and kind of put it all into you know put together the article after mm -hmm. someone actually makes the thing and then they take pictures in their studio of the build along the way and that's how they get all that nice lighting and everything that you usually see on those that magazine's just wonderful for that very easy to follow along with and, and build things and if you're visually oriented there's always plenty of pictures mm -hmm. so that'll be coming out in the summer issue and it should time right so that when I go to the Maker Fair here in North Carolina up in Raleigh uh, I think that's June 18th this year mm -hmm. Um, they'll give me some magazines to sell and I can autograph them too. So, oh, cool. And there's a little bit of talk of there might even be a cover feature on the article, which would be super cool. That would be super cool. <laughs> yeah, that would be, be super cool. cool. And yeah. I think actually for the, uh, uh did Whisker want to say something? Yeah, I was going to say <laughs> when Wire did Lean More, they were going for the sexy, but I think Make's, Make is really, really going for the sexy, getting Dean on the cover. Yeah, I had a wah pedal installed in my throat years ago. <laughs> so, um, with actually, when with, speaking of the the dog launcher, the dog or the ball launcher, the dog launcher, <laughs> <It's funny>. the ball... <laughs> oh, oh, Sophie, <laughs> there goes Rover. <laughs> um. <laughs> So with the ball launcher, you actually uh, got a professor to make that uh, the final project, I guess, for his class. Is that correct? Oh, it was, uh, well, yeah. Like it was a midterm or? A group of people did it at the uh, University of uh, Oklahoma. Right. Uh, in engineering students, they had to pick a project. And this one guy was in a group of like five people. And the project they chose was this, you know, the ball launcher. And so... They, you know, were in contact with me about the whole thing. I made them a video just for them to explain how it went together. And and they built one, not from my step-by-step -step instructions, just from like, here's the basic design of how it loads up potential energy in a spring and then lets it go. So did they end up showing that to you or? No, but they, they pulled it off. It was a total last minute thing. They were like down <laughs> to the 11th hour up the night before all night making it work right. And then took it in and did their presentation with no sleep, you know, the typical. Yeah classic college cram thing right Before presentation and the guy even said like i totally screwed up man we didn't start till like three days before wow. <laughs> but they got a great they got a great grade on it and okay. and that was that was awesome god yeah. that was a high point of that whole thing for me that was really really cool to have that happen <laughs> because i was thinking because they actually had contacted you quite a few days before it was due like i think when the oh. first project was first yeah, it was like a month late. Right? And of course, you know, they're college students. That's, you know, that's, that's required. It's for, yeah, procrastination is, I suppose, required. Socially, anyway. <laughs> gotcha. But that was great. That's just, you know, I can't even express what that is to me when, you know, students pick a project I did and then ask me for help. And just mentoring to me is everything because I had that when I was a kid from some ham radio guys and they were just the best. They were so cool. They loaned me equipment to listen to stuff and explained what sideband was and how everything worked. And I was into building antennas and you know, they they would sit and talk with me about these things. It was my first encounter with geeks. And it was like, wow, these guys are cool. <laughs> <laughs> I want to be like that. And so there you go. You know, that yeah. was something I could relate to, identify with. And, yeah. you know, it was kind of like the, a social, I don't know, whatever you want to call it, cripple, whatever, for years and in school. But found those guys and that was a, a thing I could focus on and just really get some self-esteem out of. So sure. that's, that's what it all means to me. And it's just really great to be given that back. Right. Now, are you a ham yet? 
Mm -mm. <gasps> Dino. No, haven't, haven't, I mean, for years I was thinking about doing it. When I was a kid, I was into it for, you know, from 13 to like 16. I was going to get my novice license and all that. You should. And never just, never got around to it. Kind of lost interest for years and all that electronics, everything. And didn't get back into it till I was in my late 30s, early yeah. 40s. But I may again. I'm sure like things have are are still the same in a lot of ways, but have changed a lot as well. Well, you don't need to um, pass a C a Morse code test. Yeah, well, I kind of have an issue with that. I, you know, <laughs> I mean, He's a purist. Here we, go. here we go, zombie apocalypse, right? You gotta, you know, what are you gonna do if you can only take like a, a old ignition coil and a battery, and you want to communicate with it? You stick a wire on one end, and you take the other, and go. <laughs> That's, I mean, the guys were doing that in the 1800s. True. And then when radio came along, they were catching hell for band splattering the airwaves with Morse code over. And then the FCC came along. That's yep. kind of, you know, <laughs> yep, yep, yep. Not, not like all of the story, but a little bit of it. So. Yep. Well, we'll at, we'll at least have you and um, Rainwagon there to, to do the Morse code for us then. <laughs> I, de I defer to the experts. <laughs> oh, I don't even know Morris code. I started to learn it, but you know, I haven't. If you don't use it, you're not, you know, use it or lose it, right? So, sure. I wrote a microcontroller program on the propeller that does it for me. I love it. That's yep. awesome. So go. it's like what text to uh, Morris code? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I plug a, <laughs> I plug a, a standard keyboard into the propeller, and I just type on it, and it in line, it just cues it and sends it out as Morse code. That is awesome, dude. That's like whisker teletype. I love it. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> Do you remember? Uh, I don't know if you guys listened to radio when you were younger. Teletype on the on the shortwave, it was all over the place. You'd find teletype. You'd be tuning and looking for somebody to listen to, and you'd hear <laughs> like, "What the hell is that?" Years later, I found out it was it was teletype. Mm -hmm. And it's it sounds like a slow motion old you know modem like the audio modem like you plug the phone into the modem right and it, that's pretty much what it was all yep. the all the bits were going through the airwaves just by a couple of different tones yep but it, that stuff was all over the place and I remember listening to it as a kid going what is that man there's a pattern to that something's up with that <laughs> I think you we should recently <laughs> uh, got Eddie a uh, uh, shiny new ham radio. That's true. And uh, it has general receive, so she can tune anywhere between like uh, 30 kilohertz and uh, uh, 3 megahertz. Wow. I think so. Uh, wait. And that'll cover all the short wave. Something like bands I thought it was 30 to 30. Something like that. Something hmm. like that. 30 kilohertz to 30 megahertz. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Now, is that a radio that's essentially, you know, doing it all in software? I mean, when you go buy a, a radio like that these days, is it's that not much? an SDR. No, it's not. Okay, it's an actual about. like uh, a Linko uh, HF ham rig. You know. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now it does have some digital stuff in it because it's new, but that mostly has to do with like the control of the variable frequency oscillator and stuff like that is all done mm -hmm. through the digital display, and uh, the the faceplate can be taken off and run through a serial cable to wherever you want. Right. Oh, so that sort of thing. But in inside, it's still running the the same old transistors and the same old uh, tuning circuits as always. Mm -hmm. Cool. Yep. So that's good to know. I'll so sleep better that. knowing that. <laughs> <laughs> SDRs are pretty cool, though. Too the uh, software defined radios I like that. Oh. Yeah. We'll see. Do they still do uh, what they used to call sideband? Is that still a, a yep. anything? Mm -hmm. Is it? Yeah, okay. they have upper sideband, lower sideband. Um, that's usually for like the, I want to say data and, mm -hmm. uh, voice. So like chatting, that's all side, like sideband right. stuff. Right, exactly. That mm -hmm. was, that was, that was what I was asking because that was my first introduction to, you know, the whole concept of being connected to the world. Like before the internet was ham radio, I would sit and listen and mm -hmm. I'd be just like, you know, slowly turning the dial, listen for some people up and down the East coast, mm -hmm. you know, just chatting with each other. And it's just something about when you're a kid and suddenly you come across two guys having a conversation and you're just sitting there listening in. <laughs> it's right. like, it's a, it's a marvel. The yep. first time it happens to you as a kid, and it's like, wow. And they swear and you're like, oh, <laughs> they, they swore. You're not supposed to do that. <laughs> That's so funny. that makes it all exciting. right? <laughs> do it again. Do it again. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I had antennas up in, in the pine trees. 
I've nice. talked to Whisker about this before, but I used, I found some formulas for how to calculate dipole antennas, and I went crazy with copper wire in the pine trees behind my house. I might have to get you to make one because I have a, my di- ten meter dipole antenna. You've got a tape measure and a whole bunch of, of copper, so you know well, that's, that's pretty fun. much it. <laughs> I guess that's yeah. true. what you need is an it's antenna just all tuner. Sorts of messed up. I don't know. I don't even know. Now Dean just brought up that uh, how the world wasn't as connected previously as it is these days and uh eddie and i were getting ready to drive out to california uh uh, by the time this goes up we may have already gone and come back but Mm -hmm. uh really really big road trip so to get ready for this we uh were watching a documentary by somebody who i think uh, dean probably uh likes ken burns oh totally love ken burns i like his style a lot and uh, a while back, he did uh, Horatio's Drive, America's First Road Trip. Wow. And this is about uh, uh, <gasps> Dr. Horatio Nelson Jackson, who uh, <laughs> bought a Winton uh, automobile in 1903 in San Francisco and on a bet for $50, drove it across the country to New York City. Wow. And he's the first person to, you know, ever make it from coast to coast. Uh, Incidentally, before any kind of interstate highways, people. Yeah. It's oh, my god, Dirt roads all the way. You for those of you born yesterday. You wouldn't even believe it because, like, I think for an auto mechanic, you'd super appreciate it because every, like, like 10 miles, you know, he'll have gone, like, 10 or 20 miles, and mm-hmm. then a tire will, like, blow out. Sure. That's, you know? uh, that's how they were then. That's why they oh, came with god. toolkits and... Early race car drivers had their own mechanic on board. <laughs> so, uh, thankfully, uh, Jackson brought a Kodak camera with him, uh, oh. the uh, medium format box camera, That's and uh, also took really good journal throughout the whole thing. So, y- you get his photographs of the people that he met along the way and his descriptions of them and how they reacted to seeing an automobile for the first time. Mm-hmm. And the the cultural shock of the idea of somebody traveling across the country one he's going backwards from what most people would think of as going across the country at that right. period in time because everybody that was going was going west sure and this guy's going east and he's not <laughs> taking a train to do it very strange mm-hmm. uh but uh he was running into all these people and they just simply uh at that period in time because they're was no way to easily get around from place to place. People didn't go more than 40 miles from their home. They just didn't. No, no, not at all. So they all know each other very intimately, and he's driving from these little intimate communities to intimate communities. And uh, it's just that the next level passed, what Dean was talking about, with how ham radio allowed people to communicate over distance and build up global communities that way. Uh, the car has also changed and the interstates has also changed the way we look at that sort of thing too. Mm -hmm. So I have a question to bring, to bring your mechanic skills, uh, to our zombie apocalypse. Uh Aha. Now, what do you think are going to be the biggest problems for people trying to drive long distances to get away from zombies? Gasoline. Okay, besides, well, besides gasoline, besides gasoline. Course, obviously that'll yeah. be number one. Yeah. Uh, well, you know, the car maintenance thing, you never know what's going to happen. Attrition is just there in mm-hmm. cars. That's how they work. Um, I don't know. It, there's just anything could pop up. So tires could be an issue. Um, you're going to have to know how to change your own tires. It's not like you're going to be able to pull into, you know, Joe's tire shop and have them get out the old... <laughs> tire machine and do it for you probably shoot you dead before you get past the door (laughs) that could be a bit of an issue um figuring out how to do your own tires uh there'll be a lot of helpless people that's for sure so that's the other issue you got to deal with you know when you try to pull over somewhere at a gas station there's going to be other people there that have been trying to figure out how to use the tools and don't know what they're doing and now there you are so Uh, anyway i digress (laughs) uh, but that that could be the biggest thing, I guess, would be just the uh, the repairs, the general repairs and maintenance. You know, I guess gasoline, things like that. You can forage for some of those things, right? Oil, all that stuff. But that would be a, a pretty tough one. 
okay. getting the getting parts to keep your car going or your whatever it is. Hmm. I felt very sorry for uh, Dr. Jackson hearing all the stuff he had to go through because oh, they didn't have auto shops back then. They didn't have they had black infrastructure. <laughs> so mm-hmm. what he had to do for tires was to send telegraphs back to San Francisco and have them <laughs> load sets of tires onto trains wow. and mail them to himself to towns that he planned on passing through in his future. Mm-hmm. So the trains are constantly passing him on his road trip, <laughs> dropping off supplies for him in front of him. Yep. Oh my God. And they yep. weren't pneumatic tires. And whenever anything nope. would break, he would have to go to the local blacksmith who is mm-hmm. normally fixing wagons or shoeing horses <laughs> and, and get them to... Built. Yeah. yeah. Well, they weren't... They were, they were made like you know like you mentioned earlier then not to go very far they're made to just kind of you know drive four miles here two miles there and and do it at a slow speed and so you ask this little car to do you know just put along all day long of course things are going to just fall apart and wear out pretty quick Mm -hmm. 5600 miles is a lot for what's essentially a bicycle with a two-stroke engine attached to it (laughs) oh yeah a really heavy bicycle (laughs) so axles and my father was born in 1914. He told me about a car called the Whippet, which should tell you a little about the car already. <laughs> you know, Whippet dog looks like a greyhound, right? But a little tinier and delicate. And this thing had little tiny axles about three quarters of an inch, maybe five eighths of an inch in diameter. Just a long rod what? of mild steel. That's all it had. And he said that they were so cheap and worthless if you drove them through a hay field, <laughs> the, the hay would wrap around the axle and break it. <laughs> oh my gosh. It would seize it up to the point where it would break. <laughs> so oh, why would anyone want to buy it? <laughs> Just like I said, look, I'm driving to the store in my car, you know. Oh so. my gosh. Well, well, yeah, there you go. That's the you know, that was the American dream. That whole thing was <laughs> happening. Here, here's your car. You can afford it. We made one for you. Go ahead and buy it. <laughs> so- I think this sort of wisdom that they had to come up with to solve these problems is really useful for talking about things like the zombie apocalypse, natural disasters and such. Mm-hmm. Because if you understand how the technology works and you can hack things together, mm-hmm. that's the main thing. Being able yeah. to hack solutions together when you sure. can't just go to the store and buy a part, that's one of the most valuable uh, skills to have. Totally is. Well, you know, like the story I told you at the beginning of this this podcast. <laughs> yeah, you Wait, gotta got to record a, a podcast in an hour. Over there. <laughs> Just rip a tube Just out of something. Yeah. One thing, yeah. Well, one of my last videos was a thing that was just, you know, a little five-minute robot, and it was just no talking, just me throwing together a little walking automaton thing out of just junk laying around. And the whole thing about it was to let people know, like, look, if you look around you, there's all kinds of things you can tear apart and turn into something else. Mm -hmm. You can have fun with it and you can also learn valuable skills from that. Mm -hmm. If you ever need to just be able to fix something on the fly, you can do that after, you know, a little bit of just playing around with what you can tear apart. Just teach yourself. And then you, you get over that little fear factor of like, Oh, what if I make a mistake thing? And that's probably the biggest hurdle for people out there is that. And then when you're in a panic, you know, post-apocalyptic situation a lot of people just curl up in a ball and go i don't know what to do Mm -hmm. wait for someone else to come along and solve the problem and just give up Mm -hmm. and it's interesting it's funny because i recently went back to my parentals place and they had just a whole bunch of little things that they needed done like they needed a hard drive taken out of an old computer i saw your post yeah yeah on that i was like yay (laughs) (laughs) well and that's exactly the thing because i was i was like you know, I mean, before toy makers, I would have been like, um, yeah, I don't want to break anything. I don't want to, you know, change anything or, you know, like mess with anything. Otherwise, I might like accidentally break something. Um, but I was like, oh, well, this is easy. <laughs> let me just, yeah. let me just tinker around with this a little bit and mess around with that and do this and do that. Oh, look, done. And my two brothers are engineers and they had been, uh, spending time with my parents and they hadn't gotten any of this stuff done. I'm wow. like, you guys are engineers, trained engineers. But they're scared. <laughs> I, well, something. something. I don't know. And so, they're afraid of that warranty sticker. <laughs> exactly. That's cut right through that thing when you bring it home. I was like, guys, <laughs> come on now. I shouldn't be able to use a screwdriver, you know, and you guys 
like just sit there not knowing what to do, even though you've been college educated, you know, specifically for this. So I thought that was that was pretty funny if they're listening. <laughs> I noted that <laughs> about engineers. I used to work at a bike shop. Um, it was my one of my first mechanic gigs was being a bicycle mechanic before I started doing cars and things, mm-hmm. which is what I do now for a living. But uh, every year they would have uh, the engineering department had to make a you know human powered vehicle, something alternative to the old classic diamond style frame bicycle, like you know, or your road bike. Mm-hmm. And so people would they'd be coming in and asking us questions as mechanics. You know, what about this? What about that? And you're trying to explain to them some of the parts of a bicycle, which a bicycle is just one of the most elegant, simple. It's there. It is. It's you can't do any better, really. People have tried, but all you're doing is just kind of taking the configuration and moving it around differently. But you still got the same amount of blocks, so to speak. You mm-hmm, know, mm-hmm. a bike is a bike, and it's pretty tough to to design anything better. And so when they come in trying to do this, some of these students have been so pummeled you know with the theory and all of the stuff that has to do with newtonian physics and forces and vectors and everything else they lose sight of the intuitive side of engineering that i call it t-l-a-r engineering that looks about right mm-hmm. <laughs> it's your guts just telling you like just do this and and just an intuitive understanding of how a thing can work mm-hmm. like something as simple as a derailleur on a bicycle and it was amazing how hard it was to describe very simple things to students in their third year of engineering because they were so caught up in their head of wanting to see it quantified right. and, and needing to because they've been tested on that kind of thing and their brain is wrapped around that sort of a mentality. And, and it was just kind of amusing to look like, this, look, this is simple, <laughs> okay? Just <laughs> turn off all of the need to understand all this stuff and, and turn it into equations and just watch, you know, you see right. how this will work. And, right. It was kind of funny. I noted that third year seemed to be the time. The second year students are still very curious. You know, they're all like, they'll listen to what you say. They get things. But some for some reason, this is Arizona State University. So maybe it's <laughs> something about their engineering department. <laughs> I don't know. But they all had to do that human-powered vehicle thing. And it was kind of kind of enlightening. Right, right. Well, I mean, I just have to, I mean, my parents are thankful that I, that I was able to get those little fixes done. Like, I mean, it was, you know, changing light bulbs and, um, now if I could just get her to do this stuff around the house, we'd be set. Well, yeah, but you're taller (laughs) than I am. I see. And I gotta Uh let, I gotta let you feel needed around. Uh, Keep, uh you know, earn your keep around here. (laughs) I I see. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, that's great. So, you know, so this hack a week thing was, you know, one project a week. And I mean, that only allows you so much time, obviously, like we've said, but um, do you have any idea of what other projects you'd like to work on, you know, in this long, longer format that you're going to start? I've got a few ideas on some things. I've got some, I just like this last weekend, finally found a really decent MIG welder again, which is awesome because I I was a big part of my creative life and a former place I lived and haven't had one for a few years. So it's really good to have a welder back again so I can start doing some of that kind of thing. So there'll probably be some videos of uh, some of that, a little bit about welding and then the artsy side of that too, because I've done some of that, you mm-hmm. know, metal, metal sculptures and things like that. Mm-hmm. So some of that will be coming up. And I've mentioned this to you before. I've got this idea for a, uh, I'd like to make a flight simulator you could sit down in and basically just plug a computer in and fire up uh, Google Maps and <laughs> turn on the flight simulator. There's a flight simulator in Google Maps. All you need is a, cool. a joystick and a keyboard and then uh, connect it with a, uh, what's that little, there's a little uh, dongle that someone makes. I forgot what it's called. You might know Whisker. It's the one that it basically outputs uh, via USB, it emulates a keyboard. Oh, so so you can like maybe with an Arduino or an MSP four thirty or whatever, you, anything like that. You can just uh, you know you can do it with a propeller. You can interface into that and send commands to it. You know that the would be AT like, Tiny can be set up to that's, do that. That's 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 it. Yeah, I think yeah. it's the AT Tiny. 
maybe something like that where you can do all the keyboard shortcuts and and assign them some pedals and you know some controls build a flight simulator a lot of people do this it's nothing new but uh, just a a simple version of it that would be um, pretty easy for you know other people to put together based on what you do and it's just more or less a throttle some pedals the flaps things like that mm-hmm. things that are just the keyboard shortcuts there's maybe a dozen keyboard shortcuts it's all in there and then of course you can fly mars too in google maps which is a lot of fun <laughs> they can do that yeah yeah there's a little it looks like saturn there's a little saturn icon up in the menu and you click on it and you can fly in f oh. basically in f 16 on mars oh, I've fun. Flown, I, I have this is on uh, google earth and google, i was google actually earth. just playing with it last night because we're getting ready to go on our trip and mm-hmm. i bought a little uh sony veil laptop uh that has a gps and a uh, wireless modem built into it so that uh i can have google maps place us live on or google <laughs> earth rather places live on the globe no matter where we drive to. Mm -hmm. Uh, It's really fun stuff to play with, and I saw that it has the flight simulator on it, but uh, I I haven't got in to play with that yet. Otherwise, he'd get hooked. It's a lot of fun, and and the Mars thing, if you like Mars like I do, I'm fascinated with Mars, and that's a lot of fun because things that you read about where NASA's going, you can actually go fly over it, fly around it, and look at it, and then when you see it, when the mission gets there and you look at stuff, you're like, yeah, I've I've seen that. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And it looks familiar, and that's that's pretty exciting. I've flown ballet marinaires end to end. It was like about two hours one evening. I just sat there and just <laughs> flew around. It's huge. It's like the scale of that thing is nuts. It's it's just that's absolutely unbelievable. I had n- I never thought I would see these things in my lifetime. I really didn't. I'm waiting so. for you to hack yourself a uh, a rocket ship. Could happen. Yep. yep. <laughs> Lots of people are doing that. Private enterprise is basically the next big jump into space, I think. Yep. Yep. It's not, it's not going to be government funded stuff anymore. They're all too busy. Did you see that <laughs> yeah. uh, that big article that went up on the dismantling of the shuttle? Mm. They took a lot mm. of pictures and explained a lot of what they did to get it ready for oh. the Smithsonian. Oh, that would be cool. If, uh, you should uh, Google sh- around for that. Yeah. I'm sure you'll enjoy it. Do you get to go into it? I don't know. I don't think so. Dang it. But they, they took out all the dangerous stuff. Yeah. Uh, all the cool stuff. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> all that cool stuff that's in there. Huh. One of the interesting parts, I thought, was how they uh, they they built the the new uh, the thruster cones on the back there. Mm-hmm. They, they, they built fake ones out of spare parts that they had laying around in case anything had broken while the program was still running. Right. They were able to build two brand new ones, but they'd never been in space, so they, they looked all shiny and new, and when the Smithsonian saw it, they were like, eh, eh. <laughs> so they had to hire artists to go in there and paint the inside of it to make it look like it had been flown. You're kidding me. <laughs> no. That's funny. What a waste. Another one of the interesting ones is that after they had taken everything out of the uh, the big bay yeah. on it, uh, you know, they took out the arm and all that stuff because they're going to keep using that. Uh, those doors are only designed to open in space or in uh, the uh, loading yeah. bay at NASA. Right. You can't open them. Otherwise. Otherwise. They, they need assistance, in other words, to hold them properly because... They're the designed weight. for zero Gs, yeah. Yeah. So yeah. once they were closed... They're closed. There's no getting back into that compartment again. So what do you do? They don't. They basically sealed it they up shut. forever. <laughs> it's like now a time capsule. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Yeah. It's funny. I sometimes I sometimes think about devices and things I'm working on. I'm like, this wouldn't work in space. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> There's so many things that rely on gravity to work right. Oh my god, all kinds of them. I don't know the. The the one the the chase, I got one more before you guys chaser. run off here, okay? <laughs> okay. One more. Yeah, yeah. Okay. okay. They had to transport the shuttle from I don't know if it was at Houston or wherever it was, but they had to transport it up to the Smithsonian, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and they've got that big airplane that they use for that. Yeah. Oh. And they showed a picture of the top of the airplane, uh-huh. and it's something that you never see, but it's got this uh, in black letters on the top of it. It it has it says uh. Uh, put shuttle here, attach shuttle here, black side down. 
That's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> that's great that's awesome just in case you forgot <laughs> <laughs> this side up delicate <laughs> that's awesome oh my god all right all right good continue i just had to get that off my chest oh that's no, that's, fine. that's perfect that little last part was the best <laughs> i was just thinking the the mouse the little mouse chaser thingy that you made do you know could work in in zero g oh, i that think one. that would be a good zombie distractor yeah could be. We could, yeah, you could attach like fake brains to it. Yeah, fake brains are you fake humans, you know, like blow up dolls, right? Mm -hmm. And then yep. just have them go around in circles. <laughs> they put rabbit brains in there and we'll eat the rabbits. Oh my gosh. And then you'd have all of these like piles of zombies just like nomming on a rubber doll. Oh, <laughs> that's so disturbing in my head. That is pretty oh, weird. That's so weird. I don't want to think about it anymore. <laughs> <laughs> But it would work. <laughs> it would work. <laughs> All right. So we've already asked Dean the uh, the end of the show questions because oh he's gosh. a return guest. So right. we can actually spend this bit of the show uh, and ask if Dean has any updates on uh, his zombie stuff. I know he had some extra ideas like 10 seconds after we recorded the last show he was on. He was like, oh, I should have mentioned. And then he listed like 10 things that he should have mentioned. <laughs> oh, you mean like... Uh... Like uh, ideas for how to survive the the, the apocalypse or the tools needed yep, to yep. survive. Yep, yep. That one. Mm -hmm. The standard question: What tools would you take with you? Yep. Uh, I'm trying to remember what I said last time, but there was the thing about the there was the thing about the battery acid thing. I remember that. Yeah. Yeah, that keeps that coming back up on the epic. show ever since. Yeah. yeah. It's epic. <laughs> well, it's just it's you know it, it'll be everywhere. So of course it would be totally awesome to have. Yeah. But it, it's basically the, the basics, things that are simple. Simple tools are the best, and those are usually the ones that are very robust. They last. They're easy to get. You take them for granted until, I mean, think of the stuff you could do with just a garden hoe. You know, I mean, other than use it for a garden hoe, you could tear it apart and you could make a weapon out of it, you know. Sure. You, could, you, could, you could make a booby trap, set it by a door, it comes up, whacks them in the head, and they could make a noise, and you wake up and shoot them with your, you know. I don't know, your green laser pointer. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, what else would be good to have around? You did a pretty good job with your, uh, uh, I don't know what number it was, but the hack where you put together a d disaster survival kit. I think it was like a tornado survival kit or something. Oh, yeah, when the hurricane, uh, Irene was potentially going to hit my area and it kind of went either side of me, basically. <laughs> Um, yeah, that, that kind of, that was, that was kind of a good exercise and like, holy shit. I mean, you got to really sit down and think, what do you really need? What are the essentials, you know, and little things pop up that you wouldn't have thought of otherwise, but it's, uh, it's mostly about water and calories, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, you got to have something and some, and clothing, something to keep warm, stuff like that. So the clothing thing. That's that's a pretty, you know, washing clothes. How are you going to wash clothes? There's all these questions that come up. You know, when you start thinking of an infrastructure collapse, there's no power, things like that. Yep. I would want to have a stockpile of stepper motors. Because <laughs> you can turn them into little generators. They're, they're so easy to turn into generators. You know, they, they put out minuscule amounts, but when you have enough of them, you know, you figure out a way to connect them into something where you can scavenge energy. True. Anything where you can scavenge. Yeah, Dean put up a, a hack on how to turn uh, servo into a little generator. And uh, just to, as an ode to Dean, on the end of one of our videos, we stuck an LED in the terminals of a uh, stepper motor and just was sort of spinning it at the end of the, the show there. Yeah, it's kind of uh, cool. I, I said it wrong at the time. I said servo. I, I meant stepper. And mm -hmm. we had like six people comment on it. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> saying you're an idiot you're you know because you know i produce a weekly show about this stuff obviously i don't know what i'm talking about oh yeah but dude you had one word wrong so that yeah. just negates it all <laughs> so for like the next four or five videos in a row we we intentionally added uh <laughs> errors involving stepper motors to every single episode after that for a while it was really fun that's awesome and we still got corrected on those <laughs> of course and it got funnier and funnier for us because you know they're not Those paying the attention. Best. Those little comment things like that where people like take both of their feet and shove them straight into their mouth, they're they're really amusing. <laughs> I had one uh, a couple weeks back. 
Or no, it was the last hack, the uh, the laser oscillograph, which, by the way, was a cool. lot of fun. And I was yeah. so yeah. stoked when I got that thing to work great. And it was a green laser. And wow. Somebody, if you saw the video, basically, I started out by thinking, well, I'll take like, you know, the little actuator inside a hard drive and stick a laser on the end of it. Actually mount the laser on it and use that to let it, you know, point out and move up and down in the up down axis, right? The waveform axis. And then later in the video, I went, oh, wait a minute, I'll just take a chunk of the old, one of the old hard drive things and break it because it's a nice front side mirror and just glue that to the end of it. It's less weight, it'll work better. And that's what I ended up with in the end of it. Mm-hmm. And on Hackaday, <laughs> some guy, some guy goes, dude, you should just take that laser off, man, and just glue a mirror onto that thing. <laughs> and somebody right below that commented, Dude, if you would have watched the whole video, you would have seen that he did that. And he put, he did that in big <laughs> capital letters. So that was awesome. <laughs> it's, always, it's always the people. It's like, it's like my one friend who said that a movie was really crappy. One second, Eddie. What? Uh, uh, <laughs> you know how those of us who make these videos, we have access to things like the insight information on the videos. <laughs> and we can tell when you skip over parts, people. I we know. can see. Addie noticed that everyone <laughs> skips over her XB tutorials unless there's video of her hands in the video. So now we just add video of her hands not really doing anything and people watch it through. Really? Yes. It's awesome. very, it's, you're all very creepy, just so you know. Really? It is kind of weird. I haven't seen the recent insights. They, they haven't been skipping over it nearly as much now that. It was like 1% retention rate. Yeah. And I'm like, but if you want, to, if you it, want it awesome just... views, just put a cat in it. Yeah. I swear. Oh, true. I swear. The last thing I did, the chase the mouse thing with the cat, that yep. got 15,000 views in like four days. I've never had a Craziness. video do that ever. Crazy. I couldn't believe it. <laughs> it just totally oh. went viral. There's a cat. See, it's that's a... That's a cats. I don't know if mice kind of... I don't know if mice do the same as, as cats, but... Now people love cats and videos <laughs> for some reason. Yeah. I was a little sad when I realized that everyone was skipping my XB portion. <laughs> It's I was sad. like, what? Because you would see the curve drop right <laughs> at the time that the XB started and then come right back up after the XBs with a couple of blips <laughs> in between for with, when people check to see if it's finished yet. I'm like, really? <laughs> oh, <geez>. Ouch. <laughs> Ouch. Uh, You're all hurting that. Eddie's feelings out there, guys. <laughs> yeah, stop it. <sighs> That's so okay. we made them a little bit shorter and we added video to them. So that, 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 that cool. should help. But uh, yeah, so th- these are the fun things that that us who make the videos we uh, we get to see it from the other side and yeah. Uh, oh gosh, I hope everyone out there appreciates the work that uh, goes into the stuff that we do and what Dino does especially. Yeah, it's uh, an extraordinary amount of work. And make sure you uh, watch his uh, stuff as it comes up and go back and watch the old stuff. Uh, mm-hmm. Make sure to comment and uh, uh, rate too because comment rate subscribe that's what donate donate also, yeah yes donate links on both our sites so yep. do that those are the things that make it possible to do this because it costs a lot of money to buy parts it costs a lot of money to you know dean likes to do it for almost free because he goes to the junkyard and digs around like a homeless man but um yeah, he still needs to get resistors and capacitors and stuff like that. Yeah, I, I actually kept all my receipts this year on what it took and everything, and uh, it's that's well over a grand I spent on oh, stuff. Wow. I can't believe it. Oh, yeah. my gosh. It's like, wow, I really? kind of thought at the end of the year it would really surprise me, but it's well over that amount. Yeah. Just on a little bit here, a little bit there, it all adds up before you know it. But, yeah. hey, my pleasure. You know, I've gotten a few people here or there, throw some donations. You know, it didn't really offset all of it, but. That's okay. That's yep. not what it's about, but it's nice to get a little bit back to help out. Yeah, yep, absolutely. And we don't really make a whole lot off of AdSense off of YouTube. I mean, Dean not so and much. us, we, we're not that huge. So uh, this sort of thing relies on you guys to help us do it. You kind of have to have millions of views before you get enough. Yeah, or, or a corporate sponsor. Enough to pay and, one bill. So know. it's a bell curve for sure. I'm, I'm yeah. finding I'm kind of just on that part of the bell curve where it's starting to go a little bit up. You know, yeah. So that's that's kind of exciting, but yep. it's definitely like that. It takes a while. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And I'll tell you what, it's it makes you feel a lot better making the videos if you know that the the support is coming in from 
the the viewers themselves yep rather than some big corporate infrastructure selling ads and making people have to look at them Mm -hmm. i've had a few of those come my way i'm sure you guys have too you know where people want you to basically just go all bunch of ads and do this and swap links and uh just Mm -hmm. mark them as spam (laughs) yep and we're not going to do that with zombie tech. So, you know, there's no sponsorship on this show, guys. So if you want to help us, you know, keep doing this forever and ever, you know, find the donate page on TYMKRS.com. And Dean's got his up on HackAWeek.com. Indeed. All right. Uh, I think that's the, yeah, we're out of time for this week. Um, is there anything uh, that you wanted to make sure that people knew about uh, for this update, Dean? Um, Not really, just to... Uh you know, check in in about another two to three weeks. I'll kind of be back into the groove again. I'm purposely just taking a little time to chill. Oh, okay. I'm going to do a couple videos over the next few weeks, kind of about some stuff, what I have in mind. And probably next week will be like a best of, I'm going to go through all 52 videos, kind of pick the one little 10 second thing in the video. That's at the heart of what the hack was about and put it up on a video. And then just, you know, it'll be 52 little snapshots Mm-hmm. Take like take the, uh, take your vacation time. You've oh, earned yeah, it. Oh <laughs> yeah, definitely. <laughs> You've earned well, it. Well, la- later this year, I uh, hope to take a, a couple of weeks and um, go up to Canada. Ooh, okay. fun! Are you going to yeah. be anywhere near us? You should come and hang out. Um, like on your way back. East. Nope, going over to um, what's it called? Um, Prince Edward Island. Is that right? Nice. Nice. Yeah, yeah. Going over there and visiting Where my relatives. peoples come from. My people. <laughs> the Acadians. Family reunion in New York this summer. That'll be cool. Oh, so. fun. Okay. Yep. Sounds good. All right. You can find Dean's stuff at uh, hackaweek.com. He's on uh, Twitter mm-hmm. at MakerDino. Correct. And uh, we're also on Twitter at TYMKRS. And you can find this show every Thursday at zombietech.tv. We'll see you And if you, you guys. watch our videos, you'll survive the zombie apocalypse. I it's guarantee true. it. Pretty much, yeah. It's true. But not if you watch the videos instead of surviving the zombie apocalypse. <laughs> nah. Don't, don't get distracted by videos don't when zombies are trying to eat you. Right. That's right. Okay. <laughs> All right. We'll see you guys next week. Bye. Keep on hacking. Bye.